everything we're talking about comes from the book of Tanya. And uh, Tanya is a staple uh, book that we explore here at Spirit Grow. It was written some 250 years ago, and uh, just to keep things nice and round. And it is a work of spiritual understanding of self. It is very much about the person and not just about any person. It's not about wicked people and it's not about super righteous people. It's about the battler, the person that has to make a choice every moment of life and every day of their life, whether they're going to do something good or something bad, something positive, something negative, something constructive, something destructive. And most of the time we don't even have enough information at our fingertips when making that decision and yet we just make decisions. So it's really the book of life, the book of everyday life. Pam. Tanya, we do, although the set that we have, um, I don't know if we lend out the sets, but I would highly recommend you get hold of one. I'll, t I'll point it out afterwards, and either you can borrow or we can, all, or I can tell you where you can get for relatively cheap, actually. Yeah, because it's, it's really, really it's beautifully written. It's so well structured. It's 52 chapters. It actually is more than 52 chapters. The first works is 52 chapters. And then um, it's got further sections of letters and, and, and appendixes that uh, just help supplement a lot of the content in there. But it's a very methodical progress to understanding self. So tonight, what we're looking at is soul birth. It's not the beginning of the book, but it's the beginning of the topics that we want to explore, which is, well, how did we come to be, and what is the nature of breathing, and what is the nature of breath? So, who here has ever watched or taken part in uh, a CPR exercise? You, have you performed CPR or just studied it? Studied it? Who here has um, actually had to perform it? Have you ever, Laura? Dummy. Oh, no, on a, on a real human being. Ruth? Not? Okay, so it's a fantastic thing. I've never done it. But apparently it is unbelievably uh, um, exhilarating where you take a deep breath in, you lean over someone who is unconscious, and you cover their nose and you breathe into their mouth and basically trying to push all the way into their lungs. It is a sensational thing. Apparently, if the person comes back, there's a great feeling of relief and excitement. And if the person doesn't, you keep going. As in CPR, as in, as it, oh no, no, of course there's still that, but there's still the notion of breathing. No, the, I'm not saying that's what we do. I'm saying the concept of breathing from mouth to mouth resuscitation, um, whether it's uh, relevant or not, is is not important. It's the concept of taking breath in from your lungs and breathing all the way into another person. Now, what is incredible about this is if you've ever breathed before. I don't know if anyone here has ever breathed, but we do all sorts of different breathing. Um, there are many, many different books written just on breathing, lots of studies just on breathing, and a lot of different mindfulness meditation exercises just are just structured around breathing. And a lot of the mindfulness exercises that are very popular today actually ask a person to take note of how are they breathing. And when I actually did this, I noticed that the presenter was quite accurate, that our breathing is always changing. Sometimes we breathe in, hold, and release. Sometimes we breathe in and out. Sometimes it's smoother, sometimes it's harsher, sometimes it's a shallow breath, sometimes it's very deep breathing. You notice when people sleep, they breathe, they seem to die for like this period that seems forever before they exhale. Um, I've been a victim of, uh, of this sort of treatment where I'll be asleep and Rochel will suddenly go, Menachem, breathe! <laughs> and I was like, I didn't realize I wasn't breathing, I was just asleep. But apparently the space between my in-breath and out-breath uh, scared her a little. So she uh, woke me up to remind me to breathe. So we have all sorts of different things about us and breathing is a very, very interesting way of detecting our stress levels. Breathing is a very interesting way of detecting um, 
how we're feeling, and sometimes our breathing can tell us things about ourselves that we aren't conscious of. So that's breathing. What I also find even more interesting in the 21st century is that nowadays, breath is being used in place of, as a form of testing, where you breathe, and there are all sorts of diagnostics that take place just based on whatever it is that you're breathing, which is fantastic. Because the breath comes from this obviously very deep spot and it picks up all sorts of great little uh, uh, micro life forms and by breathing out, all sorts of tests can be done based on our breath. I'm not even talking breathalyzers to know if we've been drinking. I'm a much far more complex. Stomach disorders, often the first thing is going to be, let's do a breath test. So breathing is not just the way we stay alive. It's not just, oh, yeah, that's how I deliver oxygen to my blood. Breathing in itself is actually a very, very exciting thing. Probably because we do breathing so much in our life, we don't get that excited. It's a bit like most good things because they're so front and center, we don't get excited by them. Uh, we almost don't consider them miracles, but if you think about it, they're, they're all miracles. All these things are miracles. So I want to look at the original breathing incident that gets recorded in the Torah. That is what tonight's class has to begin with. In the beginning, when, uh, when the idea of man being introduced into the world came to fruition, the Torah says, Vayipach ba'ap of nishmas chayim, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is what it says in Genesis, that Hashem breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam. And from there, Adam breathed. Or brothed. No such word, but he breathed. So, this breathing is a very interesting thing because we all know well that Hashem, Creator, Infinite, God, use whichever word you want, has no body. If there is no body, there is no mouth, there is no nose. If there is no mouth and there is no nose, there is no breath. There are no lungs. So what is this metaphor? And what's it a metaphor for? And so even if you want to go, well, Hashem created a natural order, there was a manifestation of a wind and the wind went up his nostril and with that, just like today, we just do a couple of chest crunches and, <gasps> and Adam came to life, the, the breath uh, entered his nostrils via the wind. That may be so, but that's surely, that's a, nice, that's a nice explanation, but it doesn't tell me why do I need the metaphor of breath? Why do I need Hashem to breathe the breath of life into Adam? Why is this something that's so important that the Torah feels the need to report it? So we have to understand breathing. And if we understand breathing, we understand the soul. If we understand the soul, we understand the human. If we understand all three, we understand where the human comes from. So last night we explored a lot more where animals come from. We explored what realm humanity comes from. Tonight we're exploring the soul and breathing. Now, I just want to talk one more thing about breathing before we actually even get into breathing. And that is that breathing is fascinating. You sit there and your lungs expand and contract and we take something from outside of us and we bring it in and we change it and then we release it. And so we are constantly taking in, changing and releasing. And the trees are doing a fantastic job reversing that. They take in, they process and they release. Um, it's not a process of conversion as much as it is a, a complete change. What comes in is not what goes out. They're, they're, we breathe in and we take what we need, we oxygenate our blood, we release what isn't needed. And it's, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a very interesting idea of taking something that surrounds us, which we looked at last night, which was sovev, an energy that surrounds us, taking it in as much as we can and as much as we need, hopefully, and then releasing. So we take from the sovev, we mamale, we fill ourselves, and then we release again, and we return it back to the state of being in sovev. And that process of breathing seems to combine inside and outside. It combines sovev and mamale. So breathing has a lot more depth than spirituality because it's not just a metaphor. It is actually a process of combining what cannot 
be combined. Normally you can't bring the external into the internal en masse. But breathing, in theory, if I could, I could inhale all the oxygen. I can't really, but let's say I could. Well, breathing would be my mechanism of how I do that. So the only limitation, breathing is not my limitation. My limitation are my lungs. If I had lungs the size of planet Earth, I would be able to absorb all the oxygen in one deep breath. So this beauty of breathing, this process of taking from outside and bringing it inside and then delivering it back outside, there's a lot of magic in there. So, Vayipach ba'ap of Nishmaschem, and he breathed into his nose, into his lungs, the breath of life. Now, there's another beautiful phrase, Va'atanafachtabi, which means you blew it into me. So we've got these ideas of... Um, how Hashem breathes life. We still have our original question of Hashem has no body parts to breathe with, but we'll get there. And just to um, conclude with an idea that comes from the Zohar, which was uh, authored by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and later printed by um, um, uh, Moshe de Leon in uh, Spain, 500 odd years ago. And um, in the Zohar it says, Man de nofach mitocha nofach, that the one who blows, blows from within him. So let's just look at this. There are different things that we can do with breath. I'm doing one thing right now. I'm talking. You can talk. And uh, talking doesn't really come from within. Talking comes from the mouth. If you know anyone that can talk, you know the phrase, oh, he or she can really talk. What does that mean? It means they go on for hours and hours and hours without stopping. They don't lose any energy. It's unbelievable. They just sit there talking, yakking, yakking, yakking. You fall asleep and they keep going. You'd expect with that much movement, they'd fall asleep. And you'd say, breathing. Now, surely this person's getting tired and, 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 and doesn't. And yet, breathing in a much deeper way can be quite... Um, tiring on the body. It can be really challenging. You look at people who are dying, just breathing is a labor. Just breathing. They can't talk and breathe because they've got to focus on breathing. Talking they can do. Even someone with almost no energy can talk. They can, go, they can murmur. They go, oh, I don't want any more. But they can't breathe. Breathing requires so much more effort than talking. Talking is, is such a slow release. You know, you get some people that talk and every time they go, they have to like <laughs> let the air out. Or they talk to a point until they run out of all the air and then they go, <gasps> you know, but the, the, if you breathe out, you will, you will clear your lungs of the air a lot quicker than if you're talking. If you um, take a deep breath in and release, it'll be gone within a couple seconds. If you talk, you could keep talking. The only reason why you have to breathe in is because your body's going, I need more oxygen while you're schmoozing. I've burnt everything you've delivered. Give me more, which is why we will breathe faster when we talk or we'll exhale suddenly when we're talking. So breathing is so much more than talking. And so we've got one notion where Hashem says, let there be and there was. Let there be light and there was light. Boom, says something, it happens, big kunts. But then when it came to actually giving life, it couldn't be let the man live. There was no talking about letting the man live. It actually had to come from somewhere much deeper with a breath. So really, really important that we, we observe this because everything came to be through speech. And we're going to have to look at what is the difference between thought and speech. But everything in this world came to be through speech. But when it comes to the soul of life, that couldn't be said. That had to be breathed. So this is really, really, really interesting. So now when we breathe and when we talk, we should just be right there beginning to pay notice. Like what is the difference between talking and breathing? And what's going on here? Am I breathing? Am I talking? Am I using lots of energy or not? So the one who, who blows, blows from within him. What was the Zohar going on about? Well, obviously, watch this. <sighs> oh, where else am I going to breathe, uh, blow from? The, the Zohar isn't coming to tell me anything physiological. It's not coming to tell me anything about the laws of physics either. It's not saying, now, when you breathe, this, the breath that you're breathing is from inside. It's saying that when you blow, the blow comes from within as opposed to speech that doesn't come from within. Blowing comes from all the way in here, all the way deep in your chest, while talking comes from the larynx, the tongue, and the teeth, and the palate. 
It's, it's a very, it's a head-based activity. When we talk about coming from within, it's coming from somewhere much deeper. So when you do the breathing tests, or when you do a, um, a breathalyzer with the police, they don't say, can you just talk into this? They say, can you please breathe? We need to get to your essence. We need to get to something far deeper. Now, it's not just, of course, with that, it's, it's, it's it, whatever. I'm not going into how breathalyzers work. It's really not important. Um, so, so, there, so we see that when you breathe, it's coming from somewhere far deeper. When we now talk about Hashem breathing, which Hashem doesn't, obviously this metaphor of breathing is coming to indicate that the force of life could not come from a superficiality thing, uh, a superficial thing like speech. It had to come from somewhere within. When we talk about within, what often comes to mind? If I say someone inside them, they're not feeling great. Where's that inside taking place? Point on your body where, where when someone says, oh, inside, they're just not feeling, they look happy, but inside they're unhappy. Where is that inside that everyone's a maven? Stomach, Stomach chest, exactly. It's coming from within. It's not coming from within. It's coming from within. It's coming from a very, very deep point. So when Hashem breathed, this is the closest metaphor to explaining that when Hashem provided life into this world, it wasn't just something superficial. It came from the very core and from the very essence of creation itself, of the creator itself. Now, I'm going to introduce a new concept tonight. It's a concept that comes from Maimonides. And this is how Maimonides describes God. And uh, a lot of the commentaries on, my, on Maimonides say, don't expect to get this. And if you, think about, if you think about it for a second, it's fantastic. If you think about it in depth, it, it, it's no good. And then you get it again, and then it's no good. And then it's good, and it's good, no good, because we don't relate to this. What is Hashem, according to Maimonides? What is the creator? What is God? God is the knowledge, the knower, and the known, all in one. So whereas we would have separated those as being three separate things, he is the knower, the known, and the knowledge, which is a fantastic notion, which means it, that Hashem really is everything. But in context of knowledge, that is, it, it's such a great thing because we know, well, there's knowledge, and that's separate from the knower. And then there's what's known. The knower. So, so there is knowledge out there. That doesn't mean you know it. Um, when you know something, you now have grasped something. So Hashem is not only the knowledge, He is the knower, and then He is the known thing. So I know that this paper exists, then I, this paper exists. Without me knowing, the paper still exists. And then there's the knowledge that the paper exists, there is the paper itself, and then there's me. Hashem is all three rolled into one. The paper the knowledge that the paper exists, and the one that knows that the paper. See, he is both paper and the knower and the known. Okay, so that's Maimonides. Go trip out on that for a while. So when we talk about Hashem now, um, um, that the breath came from within, obviously talking about that it came from somewhere deep within, we're saying that there is both a, a depth and a superficiality to Hashem. And in order to explain superficiality and depth, I can't go into too much detail because that would require its own four-hour class. And tonight, tonight's four-hour class is dedicated just to, to this topic of breath. Um, I want to use an example of Ratzona Elyon, Ratzona Tachton. Ratzona Elyon is what a person truly wants and Ratzona Tachton is what they want in order to get them to what they really want. So the metaphor that I gave last night to someone, I don't remember who it was, was that uh, you have, let's use a really crass one because I relate to crass things. I, I apologize for drawing you all into this crass world of mine. You have people that like money. I happen to know one of those people. They love money. Their quest in life is to be wealthy and to have who knows how much money. And in that love for what money can buy and that love of money itself, that person finds ingenious ways to make money. So one of the ways that a person may choose to make money, in my metaphor, is they will choose to build a shopping mall. Now, a shopping mall is a fantastic, fantastic way of making money if it's a successful mall because you've got lots of little shops that make money 
and they all can pay their rent. And then you've got your actual mall, and you, you know, this, it's this massive property development. Then you've got the car park, which earns money. It's fantastic. It's a great business model if you can invest in such a thing, apparently. And so you have the mall. Now, but does the person who owns the mall really want a mall? Is that what they, did they grow up thinking when I grow up, I'm going to build a mall and it's going to be the best mall in the world. Why? Because I feel that's what humanity needs. No. When the person built the mall, he said, I've got, or she said, I've got choices. Buy lots of little shops everywhere or build a mall where all the shops will come. That way I can regulate the rent. I can put the rent up because all the big shops are there. I create my own fundamental um, financial ecosystem. And it was never about the mall. It's just what the mall delivers. But if that person walks through the mall and sees that there's dirt on the floor, is he or she going to get upset? Yes. Well, my mall is dirty? What's going on here? Or if there's a shop that he or she doesn't approve of, is going to say, I'm allowing that into my mall? This, I'm letting this schmutz into my mall. I'm not allowing this. This is a high-class mall. And you'd say, wow, this person is really quite passionate about their mall. But don't be mistaken. Their passion and love for the mall is not because of the mall, it's because of what the mall delivers. And this person knows that if the mall is messy, if the mall is untidy, if the mall has shops that are of ill repute, it will keep people away and they won't go shopping there and he will not have his money or her money. So therefore, we've got Ratzona Elyon, the higher purpose, the higher um, um, reason, and the lower reason. The higher reason is to make money. The lower reason is I want a mall. I want money. I want a mall. Those two wants are not the same. One is a want that delivers the greater want. So we we see that there is this concept of depth and superficiality. If you think about, we we live ratzon eli and ratzon atachton every day of our life. If you've got children, what's in the best interest of your children is your ratzon eli, and therefore you do all sorts of stupid things. That's ratzon atachton, like work. But I don't really want to work. It's just I need the money so I can put my kids through school. Or I want to have a, a house and a roof above their head. So a lot of people, believe it or not, some crazy stat, 80%, 60%, you know, the Harvard Business Review is always rev- revising this. But majority of people work in, in fields that they have no interest in working in. Or there is no fulfillment or no joy in, in the work that they're working in. And why are they doing the work? Well, it pays. And I need the money. I need the money, not because I'm working. I need it for whatever it is that I really need the money for. It may be your children. It may be the planet. It could be anything. And therefore, we do all sorts of things every single day. And sometimes we even immerse ourselves in it. But it's not for it. It's for the bigger picture, what it is a part of. Only a small percentage of people get to do what they really love, in which case they're actually doing their rats on an alien. But even within that, I can give you an example. I love what I do. I love running Spirit Grow. I love teaching in Spirit Grow. But there are parts I don't like such as I've got to sit in um, occasional administration meetings and I've got to look at whether the advertising was done correctly. What do I care for advertising? What do I want to be involved in that? I don't want to do that. I just want to sit, prepare classes and deliver. I want to meet people. I want to talk to people. I want to learn from people. I have to sit on nourisher advertising and is the color right? Is it wrong? Is the wording right? Is it wrong? Yeah, you have to, because if you want people to be at the classes, you've got to advertise them. So I need the Ratzon Atachton. I need to be involved in that lower order work in order to achieve my higher order work. So we do see, uh, now, are the two things part of the one? Ultimately, yes. Advertising is part of a class as much as preparation is part of a class. You'll say, no, it isn't. It is, because the class doesn't happen without. They're different aspects. So we have an external and we have an internal. We have a superficial and we have a a depth. And that is what we are talking about. Speech is superficial. Breathing is depth. The energy for speech is minuscule, the energy for breathing is far greater. When Hashem breathed, it wasn't just that he was breathing, Hashem was drawing, if you could say, from a core central point. And I'm not going to say it's from a core central point, because then you could say, well, this is God's internal and it spreads outward. But rather, the energy that was required was all the energy that God had in that moment of investment. And it was all of God's passion in that moment, as opposed to the creation of the world, which was lower order. I'm telling everyone tonight that the creation of the world was Ratzon Atachton. You look around the world, look at the universe. Now, this is an amazing meditation. People do this before saying the Shema prayer, where you um, uh, sit there and you conceptualize the whole planet, 
the whole galaxy, the whole universe, and you say, all that is trivial. All that came to be through a, through a spoken word. Hashem spoke and it came to be. And we'll say, oh my God, it's so complex. If you zoom out, you look at the complexity of the universe. You zoom all the way in, you see the complexity of an ant hole. And you go even deeper, you look at this, uh, the subatomic level of the ant, and you go, oh my God, this is amazing. You put anything under a microscope, it'll blow you away. You just look at, how does this work? How did this even happen? That's why I, like, I believe people should study the theory of evolution, just to get a better appreciation of what God did. Because that is incredible. On a, from a, a single cell, so much happens. This happens all the time. If anyone's been involved in making a baby, they'll know that a, um, um, there's quite a beautiful miracle in where a single cell gets turned into a complex trillion, b millions and trillions of cellular thing called a human being. And it's either male or female. And if it's male, it can produce new things. And if it's female, it can, it, it can produce new things. And it, they do so many amazing things, these things called humans. If you look at anything... All animals, all plants, everything's amazing. You look at the ecosystem, you go, it's amazing. And it, once you get all tripped out, then you say, and you know what? It's speech. It requires no energy. This wasn't even the point. The whole point of all of existence was just to allow the man to exist. Just to be able to get to that moment of whew, the soul being breathed into the body. So this depth. Um, that happens, it's, it's not just a depth from a core point as opposed to external point. It is the point as opposed to everything else, which was nourish. I'll do it. Fine. It's not the point. The, everything that exists in this world came from speech. Vayedabar Hashem, Vayemar Hashem, Hashem spoke and it came to be. This, the breath. So now that we've got a clear understanding of superficial and depth, We've got the exterior and the interior. We can now look at what happened. So it says, That the soul is a part of Hashem. The soul. So um, this is a, 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 a fascinating concept. And is it possible to turn the volume just, just to stop the clicking? That's okay. Um, just the, the clicking noise uh, um, distracts, but that's okay. You feel free to use the technology. Um, so, where was I? was I? I was about to start a new concept. Ah, soul, soul, that's right. Soul is part of Hashem. The soul is part of Hashem. So if I just say that one more time, what do you think? The soul is a part of Hashem. So we all have a soul inside us. Everything in this world has a soul. Which means, where is Hashem? Within me. Within me. This is absolutely brilliant. Everyone goes looking for Hashem. <laughs> the only place people don't go looking for Hashem is in the mirror. Because they assume that the thing that they're looking at in the mirror is not Hashem. That's me. I now need to find Hashem. So, this, this, is, a, this is a brilliant concept. Why leave the house? I now know what my next idol is going to look like. <laughs> Me. The only thing is I don't see Hashem because there's unfortunately this thing called me in the way of really seeing my soul. My body obstructs me from seeing my soul. However, I know my soul's there because my body lives. So that's why I can't worship myself because I'm not just me. I am a complex makeup of all sorts of different energies and dynamic uh, existence. But within me, ultimately, there is a part of Hashem. According to some commentaries, when we make a blessing, um, we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, and the next word is Elokeinu, which means our God. What does that mean, our God? We, don't, we, we, can, we, we haven't registered, we haven't trademarked God. In fact, other religions have. We, we, what do you mean, our God? Ours as opposed to anybody else's? So God is now divisible. There's the Jewish God, there's the Muslim God, there's the Christian God, there's the Buddhist being, whatever it is. What does it mean, our God? When they were giving out the land of Israel, so we just want to touch on infinity. When they were giving out the land of Israel to all the people, and they got their different lots, they were different sized plots of land. And some got large, some got small, some got fertile, some got less fertile. It wasn't a great place to live in some parts and other places were great. Some got capital cities and some got little villages. And um, no one complained. No one complained about um, 
the land allocation. Why? Nowadays, everyone would complain. If you look at what's going on in Israel right now, in the Middle East um, peace process, not so peaceful process, whatever you want to call it, um, they'll say, hey, why don't you have this land? And they go, no, I don't want that land. I want that land. Everyone needs the same piece of land nowadays. And yet, when they carved up the land, everyone was happy. So there's those who like to be nice and altruistic and say, oh, of course we know why they were happy. They were one nation. They were all happy for each other. There's a beautiful law in the laws of Shabbat that says you're not allowed to do a lottery on Shabbat. You can't do lotteries on Shabbat. However, if you're sitting around the Shabbat table and you have 10 pieces of chicken and you have 10 family members and you want to give it out in a fun way, you can do a lottery. Uh, now, those 10 pieces of chicken, even if they're not the same pieces, you can still do a lottery. So if someone's going to get a nice triangle or a pulka, another person's going to get a little wing, someone's going to get the neck. And you'd expect, hang on, some people are going to be pretty upset. What, you go, we're doing a lottery? I'm the biggest guy here, I get the neck. The smallest person gets a, 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 a pulka or a triangle or a breast. Well, how's that work? And the Code of Jewish Law says, no, not to worry, because when you're with family, everyone's happy for each other. So no one's going to be upset. So, you know, there's this beautiful um, altruistic way of a family life. So some will say, well, of course no one complained when they went to the land of Israel. They were all happy for each other. Absolute rubbish. Humans are never happy for each other. So we've got to find a deeper reason as to why everyone would have been happy. Now, we know that when the Jewish people went into the land of Israel, they were going on a spiritual quest. They knew they were not going to the best piece of land in the world. Um, physically. Uh, there were other plots of land. It wasn't a very large piece of land. And they also had to go to war. There were a lot of war land in the world that didn't have uh, any population living there. Yet they chose the meeting point of Europe, Asia, and Africa. They chose a point where squatters had come in and taken over the land which their ancestors had lived in a few hundred years before. And yes, they decided to go for it. And the reason is because they needed the land of Israel for its spiritual energy, for the soul within the land. And they were willing to take it over. And then when they carve it up, they knew this wasn't about who would get which agricultural section. This was every single tribe belonged in a particular area of the land so that it could accomplish something spiritual. Everything accomplished something spiritual in the land and everyone has their place. So everyone has their place in the world and everyone has their place in the land of Israel. As in spiritually, our soul connects more with one area than another area. Now, you'll say, well, why the different shapes and different sizes of plots of land? And so according to Hasidism and according to Kabbalah, each, because each piece of land represents infinite energy and you just need to click in with your infinite energy, it wasn't about the size, it wasn't about the location, it was about being where you were meant to be. And when you have a little bit of infinity, you actually have all of infinity. There's no such thing as a little bit of infinity. So if you could, in theory, this is impossible, but just go with me. If you could have a little uh, a bit of half a cup of infinity or a whole cup of infinity, it wouldn't make a difference because infinite is infinite. So it didn't matter where you were in Israel, you got your peace, but, and that gave you the portal to the realm of in, infinite energy. So... When, when we talk about soul, a little element of soul inside us, do you know what that means? It means that within us there is, an, a, there is a portal to the infinite energy. Not only that, but there is a small amount of infinite energy, I know that makes no sense, a small amount of infinite energy inside me. I don't live because I'm plugged into a power point. And in this country, most power comes from brown coal. I'm not plugged in. I'm, I live because I'm plugged into something even more powerful than nuclear energy. It's spiritual energy. I have no wires. The only wire I have is the umbilical cord between me and the creator. Between me, I, I, I'm doing this because I don't know why. Where is the creator? Where is the infinite being? The infinity is everything. So this is just a, a natural thing. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> Um, the, the soul within me connects with what is outside me. Now, remember what I said earlier about breathing, taking something from outside and bringing it in. And the breathing is the process of, con of, of connecting outside and inside. So I've got like this umbilical cord that is plugged in here. I've got an extension cord that's plugged in here. And it's also plugged outside of me to everything outside me. Everything that radiates around me is being absorbed within me. And, and the in and the out are completely one. 
I just don't see that. Because I can't see my inside, I can almost assume my inside doesn't exist. Right? What exists outside of this room? Nothing. Nothing. Apparently there's a world out there, but we can't be for certain because there are no windows in this room. Uh, the, the world's flat, then it became round. Did the reality change? No. People's understanding changed, but as a result, everything changed. So often, if we don't know something, it can't be. Um, uh, there's an archaeologist that I like to quote who, who said, um, uh, until we discover things, they don't exist. So right now, King David did not exist. But tomorrow, when we find a coin that comes from King David, we'll say, oh, yeah, King David existed. So we are deciding today in 2014 as to whether or not something happened 3,000. He said, this is a hypocrisy. This is, this is obnoxiousness. Only if I know something can it exist. If I don't know it, it can't exist. But we are like that. I don't know if I've got a soul. Therefore, it most probably doesn't exist. Why? Because when I look in the mirror, I don't see the soul. In fact, most kids won't even believe you when you tell them how your anatomy works because they can't see it. They can't process it. They can't get their head around it. Only once you've seen pictures and you've done studies and you come to understand by the fact that this happens, obviously this is what's going on inside, do we start believing the, what the anatomy um, classes actually tell us about ourselves. So the soul inside me is this little bit of infinite. Where does little bit of infinite come from? It has to come from infinite which means infinite gave of itself to allow life to exist. So that process of breathing wasn't Hashem just saying, oh, Rotsana Tachnan, I really like that. I think I'm going to create it. It was that. That is me. That is me. In, 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 in. I'm going to put myself into that thing. And Hashem breathed and the soul, boom. That was when souls came into um, manifestation into a body. The concept of souls, though, existed thousands of years in a place that had no time. But let's just say thousands of years before. Because it says um, that before the creation, the Kabbalah says, um, uh, it goes into a whole explanation of this idea of Nimlach, that Hashem consulted with the souls of the righteous as to whether or not to create existence. Now, if existence didn't exist, how, did, how were their souls? So Hashem isn't consulting with any external being. Hashem is consulting with himself, which means that this is a thought process, and thought is part of the one, so there's no exterior. We, when we think, there's a difference between the way we think and the way God thinks. When we think, there's us and there's what we're thinking. You're all doing it right now. You're becoming aware of your thought. You go, oh, oh it's true. Hang on. But is it separate from you? No, not at all. You can't separate your thought from you. You can't even put your thought on paper. No one can put their thoughts on paper. At best, they can talk about an element of their thought or paint an element or draw an element or write an element, but it will never capture. You know, you have a 10-second dream, you'll never be able to capture it. You'll never be able to put it into words. In fact, what's so painful about dreams is that in impossibilities take place. You haven't even got the words to describe the impossibilities, such as time may not exist in a dream. You can't, you've got, we've got no words to explain this timelessness. So dreams are this absolutely fantastic, but even dreams are a creation. They're a figment of our imagination, and, and it is a creation on some level. It is not me. It is my thought, and I and my thought are not one. On the other hand, I and my thought are one. Now, that's us. Hashem is Hashem's thought. Because remember what I said from my memories. Hashem is the knowledge. He is the knowledge. He is the knower. So I have my knowledge and there's me. Hashem is both in one. There's no separation. It is all one. So Hashem's thought process is one. So when it says that Hashem consulted with the souls, that means the souls already existed because there was no need to create because Hashem consults with himself. Hashem doesn't consult because Hashem is himself. Hashem is the knowledge. He is the knower. He is everything in one. And therefore, boom, when he needs to extract a soul and put it into a body, what am I saying? That the knowledge, the knower, the soul, and the thought, it's all one. That means he just extracted an element of himself and put it into the body. And because nothing can separate itself from God, therefore the body is God. And therefore, the body within the soul is God. And therefore, when it says, when he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Hashem actually gave of himself and placed it proverbially into the body, into the person. That's incredible. That is incredible. There was no breathing because Hashem doesn't breathe. There was only giving of self in a, in a space-time continuum.
But where did it come from? The Zohar tells us, Man de nofach mitoche nofach, that the one who blows, blows from within him, means that it came from the very core. It was no, there was no um, um, process of, of, uh, of uh, tzimtzum. There was no process of having to change and break down. It, was, it is core. And so if you want to know what is keeping us alive, it is core infinite energy. There is only one being in this world that is not aware of it. Us. And because we're not aware of it, we don't maximize it. In fact, we probably don't even utilize it. And the worst part is we don't even know how to. Even if we wanted to, we wouldn't know how to. But just the awareness already can create a feeling. And that feeling can lead to passion. That passion can lead to quest. That quest can lead to learning. That learning feeds the love. That love feeds the passion. The passion continues the quest, which t t drives us to the knowledge. And slowly but surely, over life, we start becoming consumed with wanting to understand who we are. So, Vayipach Ba'ap of Nishmas Chaim was that on day six of creation, the Rotsan Atachton had been finished. The lower order of creation, the need for physical existence had happened. Now the purpose had to come into being. And that purpose was, let's, let's, let's give of ourself, says Hashem, and let me place it into something that sincerely believes that it is independent. The human being. The human being believes it is independent of the creator. In fact, what's so amazing about us is we don't even know if there is a creator. In fact, most of us would deny that there's a creator. And that's so cool that we can be created. We are the only apes in this world. In that, you know, we know where we come from. We know that mummy and daddy one night had a bit much to drink and now we're here. That's how we came. We, 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 know, we know where we come from. And we're happy to go with that story. We are not happy to go with a story that we can't get our head around. And therefore, the notion of creation, which is impossible for us to get our head around. I'm going to tell, put that out right now. Creation is not a fact. Not based on what, how we define fact. It is a theory based on how we define theory. And what is so amazing is that the infinite energy cooks inside us, allows us to exist, connects us to it, and we deny consciously that connection. And the best part is Hashem doesn't even give a toss. Still allows the energy to keep flowing. Now, if you just imagine, especially in the last hundred years, parenting procedures. Child, 16-year-old, walks into the house and says, stuff you, mum and dad. And mum and dad say, uh, beg your pardon? And he says, yeah, I'm absolutely sick of you. Don't you ever walk into my bedroom again. And mum says, sorry, whose bedroom did you mention? How often have you heard mums or have the mums at the table said, uh, no, that's actually, it's my house and that's my bedroom, young man or young lady. Don't you go slam that door and boom, they slam the door. And they say, no, that's my bedroom. And the parent says, no, your bedroom, you pay rent. <laughs> and he are you crazy? You're going to ask me to pay rent? You're my parent. So, oh, well, it's my house. And my house has rules. And we go for this vicious thing and we read all the books on it. So this is who we are. This is how we live. We, we walk into the bedroom. We go, this is my space. And the creator says, my home. And we say, mm -mm, my, my home. And the creator, like all good parents, says, okay, I'll give you time. I'll wait till you finish your teen years and get over it. And that's why we end up with midlife crisis. We finally get over it and we start wondering, well, what is the point of it all? But coming back into here, it's not about a per human analysis. Tonight is about discovering this creative birthing moment of breathing. And every moment that we breathe and we take in oxygen, not only are we meant to appreciate that that system works, but we're actually also coming to appreciate the original system from where all breath comes from. We only breathe because there was an original breath. Breath was created when Hashem breathed into us the breath of life. After that, breathing started taking place as far as humans were concerned. And so we breathe because it's part of our essence to breathe. And when we stop breathing, the breath stops being breathed into us and our soul leaves the body and soul and body depart from each other. So as long as we're breathing, it's not just great we're alive. It's a sign that we're alive. It's a sign that there is constant spiritual breathing being pumped into our body, which means every moment that we breathe, we should be excited because we have 
infinite energy inside us. That's my point for tonight.